Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Shay with Curate Soul and I am here to share September's Bhavana. And before we get into um, our Bhavana for this month, I just kind of wanted to give a, a personalized update. I'm in a new space. As you see, we have officially moved into our new home. We're still settling in some things to um, take care of and unpack, but for the most part, we're here. Things are feeling really nice. I love this room particularly, so this is where I spend the majority of my day uh, doing work, uh, whatever that may be, whether it's bookkeeping, I'll do some yoga. Um, but yeah, so things are feeling a little more uh, settled and grounded, but now we are moving into a seasonal transition. And so where things felt very, very hectic for me personally, and maybe even for um, some of you listening over the summer, uh, that things were very mobile, uh, lots of things going on, lots of balls that you're juggling in the air. Um, you may feel that some of that has begun to settle, but now there is this other shift that is happening. And so um, this month's practice, this month's bhavana, all kind of relates to that seasonal shift. Last month, we were exploring the third purusharta of kama, desire pleasure, longing, wish, and Kama's relationship to Ayurveda. And so I'm leaning into that. I always have the lens of Ayurveda, uh, whether I'm speaking to it or not, um, and when I'm sharing these offerings and these teachings uh, with those of you now through the newsletter or in a public setting or with private clients, I am always uh, coming uh with those teachings through the lens of yoga and so seasonal or excuse me through ayurveda and seasonal transitions especially this one summer into autumn are kind of very important times in the year transitions in the year when we uh, really want to reflect on our health and well-being this is one of the considered more difficult transitions in ayurveda um, because we are moving from a time of the year that is very fiery in nature and so there's a lot of heat and we need fire fire is uh, responsible for transformation it's responsible for digestion uh, and again not just physical digestion but emotional mental digesting our life whatever that may be uh, but too much fire destroys as you know so when things are too hot uh, it can burn or inflame our words can become sharp. Uh, we may find ourselves getting angrier, quicker, our tempers flaring quickly. And so when we transit, begin that transition into autumn, which is related to vata dosha and the elements of air and space, it is like taking a fan to a bonfire. We begin to fan those flames, which then just stokes that fire even more. And so on a physical level, we may begin to notice that our digestion um, begins to shift, maybe even slows down, or we become more sensitive to some of the things that maybe were not bothering us in the summer. Um, we may find that our sleep becomes a little disturbed where we are dealing with insomnia or more frequent bouts of insomnia and as things become lighter and airier and even more mobile in nature we're going to find those same qualities within our mind within our body within our digestion um, and so this month the practice that i'm sharing within my public classes and then also the the mood the bhavana that i'm sharing in the newsletter really has this relationship with anchoring into stillness. So grounding that mobile quality of air and of space, and even that mobile quality of fire. And so I'm offering slower movement, very grounded um, moon salutations for those of you that are familiar with yoga asana, and then um, my favorite, yoga nidra. So we are moving into deep rest. And this is all inspired and related to, um, again, Ayurveda, yoga, and the third purusharta of kama, pleasure, desire. I may have spoken to this last month as we closed out um, 
our comma and Ayurveda segment, or you may have heard me mention this in a recent yoga class offering, that uh, one of the teachings or lessons of the Bhagavad Gita is that the practice of yoga is there to help make the unconscious conscious. And so what that means is that if we begin to think about it, our unconscious mind is actually the one that's in charge, the one that is kind of making these decisions and uh, taking these actions and even speaking the words <laughs> that come out of our mouth. It's that unconscious or subconscious mind. It's not necessarily that consciousness that we have. We're not always uh, in the present moment. We're not always aware of um, our immediate reaction, the way that our nervous system works, the way that uh, we are as humans in general, the way that our mind works and gathers information and then applies the new information to old information, to memories. So that really kind of uh, directs this unconscious part of the mind to kind of be the one in charge. And so the practice of yoga is then to begin to understand these unconscious desires or habits or tendencies and to uncover them so that we know, okay, these unconscious aspects of myself, are they in alignment with my highest desire? Are they in alignment with the steps that I want to be taking in my life? Uh, are they in agreement with my beliefs? So what are the practices that uh, yoga can offer us to help us uncover? So scripture is one of them, the teachings, the Puranas. So whether it's storytelling, whether it is something like the Bhagavad Gita or the sutras, um, you can dive into spiritual texts of all sorts that will offer you um, different directions, different paths to take. But then you also have the eight limb path. You have meditation, a stillness practice. You have uh, one pointed focus. You have yoga asana. You also have the yamas and the niyamas. And so I opened this month in my classes with um, coming back to something that I spoke to last month. Pratyahara, the withdrawing of our senses. Because our five senses are constantly seeking pleasure, looking outside of us to the external world to find the next pleasurable moment, whether it's through um, vision or hearing, uh, whether it's through tasting or touching or smelling, we are extending our life force, our prana, outward. And the practice of Pratyahara redirects our life force inward. This is what is responsible for um, restoring, building, and uh, maintaining our ojas, our tank, our vitality. And so I just came back to this idea that we can begin to take these same five senses and turn them inward and begin to explore the inner landscape. And in this inner landscape, uh, we begin to find this stillness, this quiet, this calm. And when we are able to kind of let all of the external noise, the outside distractions just melt uh, to, I won't say disappear, but just to become background noise as opposed to the foreground noise that we are experiencing, then we can begin to discern and create clarity around what is maybe unconscious, maybe what our tendency and our habits are, and then begin to explore whether those tendencies, those habits, those unconscious thoughts, words, actions uh, are in alignment with the way that we want to lead our life. Are these thoughts, tendencies, habits, are these ones that we've developed over time because we have created a nervous system response to protect ourselves? Are they ones that we have inherited karmically? Uh, learned, unlearned, whatever it may be, uh, whether it's something that, you know, we began to crea create ourselves, or if this is a karma that we have come into this life with, that it is now time for us to unknot. So stillness practices, often called mindfulness practices, that's kind of the buzzword now, those can be lots of different things. Like I said, meditation, uh, it can be journaling, getting just our thoughts onto paper to create some clarity, free writing, um, mantra chanting, 
uh, Yoga Nidra, my personal favorite as always, because in the state of Nidra, we are no longer entangled in those vasanas, those samskaras, those unconscious habit patterns or action or thought patterns. And so this it's a very kind of um, accessible practice for most. Um, it doesn't require any sort of uh, movement or uh, really any sort of props, just as long as your body can find a comfortable position to uh, move into deep rest, you um, can begin to move into this state of nidra that is uh, this very healing, very quiet, very calming, where you can begin to explore your inner landscape. And so for many of, the, of us, a practice of stillness or mindfulness, uh, maybe even journaling, meditation, uh, can be a bit daunting. It's not necessarily uh, a practice that we learn at a young age or early on or a practice that's even encouraged in this culture. We are very much a culture of action-based um, uh, uh, movement and actions. And so uh, trying to achieve something, to accomplish a goal, to get a job done, uh, we're not encouraged to rest. We're not encouraged to find stillness, to be quiet, to listen inward. Uh, we are very much encouraged to continue to direct our life force and our energy outward. So when we begin a practice of mindfulness or stillness, we may find some resistance. And this is what the yoga tradition calls tapas, T-A-P-A-S. And so tapas is often translated as heat or friction. And this is the friction or the challenge that is going to create a positive shift, a shift in the direction that you want to move into. Um, so this can be equated to maybe breaking a particular habit that you've had. Um, you know, let's say that you are used to going to bed at 1130 in the evening and you really want to uh, begin to go to bed earlier so that you can wake up earlier. Uh, let's say you're waking at seven now, but you want to move that wake time to six. So you begin to shift your uh, bedtime so that you still receive the same amount of sleep. Now you're not going to, most of us anyway, are not going to be able to do that just like that. Just like flip a switch and all of a sudden, okay, I'm going to bed at 9 30, 10 o'clock and I'm now getting up at six. It will be transitional. There will be moments where it will seem uh, maybe easy that we can do that. We're fairly tired one evening, so going to bed at 9.30 uh, is super easy, and it's you know as just as easy to get up at 6 in the morning. But then there are those moments that um, the body, the mind, the nervous system remembers, oh, okay, uh, I used to go to bed at 11, 11.30, or your favorite Netflix show is on. I'm going to bed 11.30 because I want to watch just a few more episodes. But then you're like, okay, 6 o'clock, that's going to be very difficult. I'm not going to feel rested. And so you're going to meet these moments of resistance, these moments of challenge. And so it's tapas, uh, that friction, that heat that begins to transform and shift and change what we're doing. So that eventually, after repetition, after a certain period of time or number of repetitions, it gets much easier to say, you know what, this show's going to be here on Netflix tomorrow. I'll watch those episodes tomorrow. I'm going to go to bed at 9.30 and I'm going to get up at 6 and I'll hopefully feel rested. And so this practice of tapas can apply um, to many, many different things and especially a mindfulness or stillness practice or the practice of pratyahara, turning our awareness inward, beginning to explore our inner landscape. Tapas also comes up as we start this journey inward and we may run into um, certain things that uh, uncover memories or experiences or bring to light maybe a habit we don't really love about ourselves. And so staying with the practice, um, the tapas of offering yourself grace and compassion when things like this arise and come up, instead of coming from a judgmental lens that is um, feeling the need to shame or to control, 
being able again to sit with yourself in compassion and realize, you know, this particular habit, this particular action, uh, this particular thought pattern uh, at some point in your life served you. But now it's no longer serving you. And it's just time to loosen those knots, loosen that bind that it has on you, and begin to shift. And so it's not going to be comfortable. Uh, tapas, again, is there, that heat, that friction, to create positive change. But we do have to stay with the practice. Uh, this is why when I work with private clients, uh, and even in a, a smaller scaled version when I'm sharing in public yoga classes that I work with a practice for a certain period of time. It's usually 30 days. Quite often in my public classes, it's just a month long. Um, so that you have something that you can anchor into, a practice that you can anchor into for that length of time. Because the shift is not immediate. The shift takes time. Um, you have to be able to meet that friction and that challenge and find yourself succeeding, but also find yourself challenged, maybe failing at some points, and then taking those lessons and turning it into wisdom, turning it into that change that you desire. So how does this relate to karma and pleasure, the third purusharta? desire. Um, I've been saying the word desire quite a bit um, because remembering that the highest form of comma of pleasure or desire is to know that place within us that is unchanging, that is free from sorrow, as my teacher Tracy Stanley says, um, to know that there is a place within us that is an anchor and a refuge and that, you know, when we're searching for answers, um, or trying to listen into our intuition. It's this place that we can come to and trust and know that we can trust it. That is the highest form of karma. That's what we desire is to know this place. But we also have desires of this householder life to experience pleasure in the external world, uh, experience pleasure with those around us, um, to experience pleasure with those that are close to us, and dear to us. And so being able to be in a place where we are aware of the actions that we're taking, the words that we're speaking or the thoughts that we are thinking um, that align with that desire that we seek. So all of those unconscious patterns are actually small desires. They may be a desire for something or a desire to avoid something. So if you remember, I think it was last month, maybe even the month before, uh, Raga Devesha. Uh, so this attraction or addiction to um, is the flip side of an aversion to. So those desires, those unconscious desires that direct our tendencies, they are desires. Whether we are aware of those or not, we are... Um, those are directing us. Those desires are directing us. And so to uncover them, to make them conscious, we begin to understand what those desires really are. Are we longing for something? Are we trying to avoid something in hopes of maybe something else? And when we begin to understand these desires, we can continue to either feed them and letting them grow if they're in alignment with what we hope, or we realize now is the time to kind of weed those desires, weed through them, um, pull them up, burn the seed, as uh, the tradition says. And as we burn the seed, we begin to unloosen those knots that desire has on us. And so just understanding how that, uh, the practice of pratyahara, the idea of tapas, helps us to understand kama. And remember, kama is any desire, any longing, any wish, um, again, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And so coming back to that lesson of the Gita, making the unconscious conscious. And just some of the tools that yoga offers us, stillness practices, yoga nidra, meditation, journaling, self-inquiry, all of that. 
Um, but now I'd like to kind of direct Kama back to this idea of Dharma. Dharma is the first Purusharta. So if you've been with me since the beginning of the year, we opened the first three months of the year with Dharma, this understanding of our purpose or responsibility or duty. And that we have an individual Dharma, a Sva Dharma, but also um, a collective or universal Dharma. And in the West, our Dharma is often equated with our career or our job, but that's not necessarily um, the, the full picture of Dharma. So one way that we can look at Dharma is that as a householder, um, you may have a family that you have to tend to. So part of your Dharma is your family. Uh, whether it is waking them up in the morning, getting them ready for school or work, uh, maybe it's a job, uh, not necessarily the career that you have, but just that you have to show up to a job. You have to clock in and clock out so that you are earning your artha, the means um, of uh, your survival, how you um, put food on the table or you know, pay for the roof over your head. So these different responsibilities, but then that collective or deeper dharma of um, understanding that part of yourself that is unchanging, that is free from sorrow. Um, and then your own individual purpose on a deeper level, not just your worldly household or responsibilities. So kama in relation to dharma is your deepest desire leading you towards your destiny you want. So this has a lot to do with uncovering those unconscious seeds of desire, really beginning to understand what is directing your thoughts, your words, and your actions. So is your deepest desire leading you towards the destiny you want or away from it? Is it aligning with the responsibilities that you have? And again, kind of a, another very easy example on a, a kind of a mundane level, if you will. But these examples help understand kind of the larger picture, the more complex idea of Dharma and Kama. So let's say your desire is to feel rested and energized and focused each day that you have to go to work. Your job is demanding. And so you know that you need to feel rested. You need to be alert. You need to be on your game. So you have to be at work at 6.30 in the morning, fairly early. And the actions that you're taking, the karmas that you're taking right now is that you are um, staying up to 11.30, watching that Netflix show that you love. And you have to get up at 5 or 5.30. And when you do this, you notice that you're not sleeping very well, you don't feel rested, you don't feel energized, and that it's very hard for you to focus. So if you continue to take these actions, these karmas of staying up late and binging on Netflix, you begin to see that this is not in alignment with your desire of wanting to feel focused and energized and alert and well-rested at work. So you then have to begin to make some changes. You have to begin to shift something to create um, actions that are more in alignment with the responsibility that you have, with the desire that you have. So again, kind of a very easy, mundane example, but it may help kind of shed some light on the larger concept of Dharma and Kama. And that doesn't mean you can't seek pleasures in binge watching a Netflix show. There's nothing wrong with that. But maybe you shift the binging to a Friday night when you do not have to be at work early Saturday morning. Or the other option, um, or the other approach, I won't say option, the other approach is um, as you begin to, let's say you make the shift, you're going to bed now at 9.30, you're waking at 5 or 5.30, you're feeling rested, and you have begun to switch your actions so that they are in alignment with your desires and with the responsibility that you have of this particular job at this point in your life. But let's say one night your friends go out and they wanna hang out, it's a birthday, and you stay out a bit later and it's past your bedtime when you get home. Um, and you know that the next day it's gonna be a little bit of a struggle at work. So instead of, you know, having 
FOMO and skipping out and, you know, and or skipping out and having FOMO on the birthday party, so that fear of missing out, you do go. You do know that you're going to have to sacrifice feeling well rested, uh, maybe even that focus at work the next day, or sacrifice that you might not sleep as well. And so the practice of vicharya, so non-attachment or surrender, that not every thing is going to always align perfectly to create the exact result that you hoped for. You can even, let's say you don't even have this birthday party to go to. You can go to bed at 9, 9.30, and for some reason you just do not sleep well that night. And so you don't wake rested or alert or feeling focused or energized. It's not anything that you did necessarily. It just happens. We can only control the actions that we take. We cannot control the results. And so we have to bring in the practice of vicharya, this surrendering, this letting go, this non-attachment. And the biggest kind of the bigger concept here, the bigger idea here is that desire is not good or bad. Desire does not create suffering. It's the attachment to the desire or the attachment to these particular results that we hope for that creates the suffering. So when we don't receive the results that we were striving for or hoping for or thinking that we deserve, then that is when we begin to suffer, that there may uh, be a sense of conflict or stress or whatever it is. So being able to let go. We're not guaranteed a particular outcome. We are only guaranteed the um, choice of our actions that we take. So the last thing I kind of want to go over is this is our last month of comma. We'll begin to explore um, a, a new Purusharta next month. And so a little bit of a recap for for comma, we opened the month with this, uh, that with defining comma as pleasure, as um, longing or desire, and that it is part of the purusharta because that highest form of comma is to know that place within ourselves, that divine part of ourselves, whether we call it soul, spirit, self, source, God, goddess, whatever the name is, but that place that we are searching for, that all of us are searching for, whether we know it or not, that place within ourselves that we can anchor into the highest form of kama. But in this human form, we are meant to experience pleasure and desire as a way of pure consciousness being able to know itself. That without desire, without pleasure, the universe would not exist nor would any of us exist. And so desire is what manifested um, uh, the manifestation, basically, all of life. Um, and so we need desire. Desire is what keeps us moving towards our dharma, moving towards our responsibility, our duty, our purpose. It's what um, helps us continue to um, find and gain this artha, the means that uh, allows us to fulfill our dharma. If we do not experience pleasure or desire, then it's very difficult to uphold our purpose or responsibility here. There will be really no incentive to um, kind of continue to seek out our purpose or to uh, perform our dharma as we should. And so... Then we moved into um, Ayurveda and Kama's relationship to Ayurveda. That sense of pleasure is related to, um, in Ayurveda, there are seven layers of tissues, and the seventh tissue is related to the reproductive system. And so um, pl pleasure, desire, manifestation, creation, all of those related to Kama and Ayurveda. And so when we are taking in food as nourishment, 
that food takes about 40 days to move through all seven layers of tissue. And the reproductive tissue is the last to be nourished by that food. And so if we are experiencing any sort of dis-ease or if we're not nourishing ourselves in a way that we should, that's in alignment with our constitution, uh, with the doshas that are kind of dominant in our uh, constitution, then we may find that we are lacking uh, a sense of health or vitality somewhere. And it can often be in this seventh layer of tissue, whether that shows up as um, dis-ease in the reproductive organs, whether it shows up as uh, dis-ease in a sense of uh, seeking or experiencing pleasure with a loved one or those around us, or even experiencing pleasure in the world, the outside world. If there's a sense of like dullness or inability to uh, feel desire or feel pleasure, that is kind of a spotlight on, okay, something needs to shift. Something needs to change in my life that creates a sense of nourishment that is very much related to, I spoke to last month, ojas, our fuel in our tank, the sense of juiciness or vitality. And we can think about ojas as the oil in an oil lamp. Without the oil, there can be no flame, no spark to light the flame. And without oil, without this vitality within us, we cannot shine our light out in the world. We cannot uh, perform our dharma we cannot move in alignment with our purpose. And this all relates to not being able to sense or feel desire or pleasure. And so Ayurveda gives us the tools that, um, uh, that help, of, help us move, helps us move back into a rhythm of alignment, cyclical rhythm in alignment with nature because we are nature. If you, for instance, have ever had um, a meditation practice or a stillness practice or even an asana practice, a movement practice, and you've experienced some sort of injury that kind of kept you from practicing that particular practice because there was some sort of discomfort when you did practice, whether it was, you know, you were seated um, in a cross-legged position in meditation, but uh, while you were seated and trying to meditate, all you could focus on was this particular achy part of your body. So what happens is we can't experience desire or pleasure when our mind is distracted by our physical body or even the subtle body feeling ill at ease or dis-ease. So discomfort of some sort. So aligning with our cyclical nature, aligning with seasonal eating, aligning with these Ayurvedic concepts of balancing with the opposites to cre create health and vitality, or the understanding that like increases like, can help us really understand how we can uh, live our most vital life so that we are experiencing desire, that we are experiencing pleasure. And when we experience these things, we are then creating that same energy and putting that out into the world. We're manifesting, whether it's manifesting something that we're hoping for and desiring, or whether we are just manifesting or putting out that same energy of vitality for others to experience to share in to support others so this is kind of a recap and our last little month in comma the idea of pleasure and desire and how that relates to dharma artha and then moving into next month the last purusharta of moksha liberation so more on that to come um just a few more little updates thank you for staying with me this long. I really <laughs> kind of got into it, I think. Um, so I am currently doing quite a bit of training. Uh, my own studies are diving a little deeper, so I'm a little quiet this autumn, uh, but there are a couple things coming up at the end of October. 
October 21st. More details will be released shortly. I am joining forces again with Jen Netherby. We hosted, we co-hosted together last year around the same time, um, the Learn to Rest workshop. She has decided to re-release that, so it'll be on-demand videos and practices. But then her and I are actually going to do one live session together where we'll share movement and a yoga nidra practice. This is going to be scheduled for Saturday, October 21st, and we are still na nailing down time as well as price. So I think right now you'll be able to select between joining just the live practice with us or um, adding the on-demand classes, the recordings from last year, plus joining live with us. So stay tuned for that. And then the very last weekend of October, um, that is the 27th, 28th, and 29th, I think. Um, I'll put the dates in the newsletter for sure. I'll be joining Rachel with Restorative Rest out on Tybee Island for her uh, Rest, Renew, Relax retreat. And so I'll be cooking Ayurvedic-inspired dinners for the three evenings. And then one of the days, evenings, days, I'll be sharing kind of an intro to Ayurveda and uh, sharing how to prepare an Ayurvedic-inspired meal. I think there are a couple spots still left for that. So if you're interested, um, take a peek at my newsletter and follow the link to sign up or to reach out to Rachel with any questions. And I think that is it for right now. I'm still teaching public classes three times a week in Savannah. So Monday, Thursday, and Friday at New Yoga Now. Um, I am sharing Mindful Vinyasa and then also subbing the occasional class. And then I will keep you posted on any offerings that will be coming up in uh, the coming months. So thank you so very much for continuing to support uh, the work that I do uh, following the newsletter and sharing with any of your friends and family. As a small business owner, that's really how I um, uh, am able to gain clients and work one-on-one -on -one with those that are interested in uh, yoga nidra or Ayurveda or yoga in general, yoga asana. And so thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I've uh, very honored to, to work with all of you and to have your support. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your month. Be on the lookout for the rituals and recipe newsletter as well. It will have some guidance on this seasonal transition. So thank you again. We'll see you soon.